So welcome everyone to your 2021 Dropshipping Blueprint with four of the founding council members of the Dropshipping Council. I'm very excited to have this panel here of dropshipping experts all on one screen. Uh, so thanks a lot guys for taking the time to come on. Yeah, of course, thanks for having us. Yeah, um, so today we'll be, we'll be talking about uh, how Q4 went for each of us in our businesses and what you guys need to be doing as our viewers to get your dropshipping business on track in 2021 and making sure that this year is better than the last one. Um, just as by way of an introduction, if you don't know what the Dropshipping Council is, it's an exclusive invite only mastermind community of pre-qualified dropshippers that have hit at least 100K per month in sales. And council members get to network with very high level dropshippers like the panelists that you see here through a dedicated Slack community. Um, they access privately held masterclasses and they also get exclusive discounts to major partners like SMS Bump, Recart, and Debutify. Um, so head over to the dropshippingcouncil.com to see if you qualify. Now let's do a quick round of introductions before we get going. Um, very excited to have with us today, uh, Mark Chapon. He used to be a chef at a Michelin starred restaurant in Paris. Uh, but he's now making six figures uh, in, in income thanks to e-commerce. Um, we also have Jeremy with us. He de he's developed uh, his own six-figure e-com business uh, in his very first year of dropshipping. And now he mentors many others to develop their own online stores. And we have Yasha, who is also a successful e-com store owner. And he also has a fast-growing YouTube channel as well, where he helps many other entrepreneurs with their, with their own journeys. Um, and my name is Shishir Nigam, and I'm the, I'm the founder of the Dropshipping Council. And I also run my own e-com stores, which have exceeded seven figures in sales alongside of our YouTube channel um, called Journey to Freedom. Um, and what you can do is you'll find the link to each of our YouTube channels uh, in the video description. And we'll also include the link to the Dropshipping Council as well, so you can check it out. So again, very excited to dive into the questions here so that we can help our audience make uh, 2021 the most successful year yet. Um, so let's get going. And um, the first thing I'll touch on is uh, talking about Q4 of last year. And there was a lot of hype uh, that went into Q4 before Q4 saying how, you know, this is slated to be the biggest Q4 ever because of COVID, because of uh, the rise of e-commerce. Um, did BFCM last year and Q4 in general, did it live up to its hype? How, how did you guys do in Q4 of last year? And anyone, anyone can, can get going. Um, so personally, I know statistically this was um, the highest grossing uh, Q4 in terms of e-commerce sales, you know, not only nationally, um, but internationally as well, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah. Uh, perhaps like globally, perhaps for me in 2019, I think um, I did better numbers in terms of revenue or sales. Um, and I think part of the reason was, again, some of you guys may have experienced it too, but there were just a lot of bans and stuff going on on Facebook in particular. I know a lot of people weren't affected at all. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, you know, I was part of that group that was significantly, especially in the month of October, um, mm -hmm. you know, where I do a lot of my testing, a lot of my split testing in terms of creatives, testing products, so on and so forth. So, um, again, in terms of at least Facebook, I didn't see results like I did in 2019. Uh, but I kind of shifted my attention more so working with influencer marketing, mm -hmm. uh, more so on TikTok and on Instagram as well. So that played out, um, a kind of a pretty great job. Um, and kind of what I learned was to always not depend on one marketing platform, yeah. always to diversify and be open and be flexible mm -hmm. to other platforms as well. So that's just kind of how it went for me. Yeah, that's great. Mark, you were giving a thumbs up. Yeah, yeah, but I completely agree. Like, I don't like to rely only on, on Facebook ads like most people do. Um, and for me, this year was actually better than 2019, um, just because I was more prepared um, and I had more tools as well. I was using Pinterest ads a lot. Uh, I was using Google ads, I was using obviously Facebook ads. Um, I was uh, spared because uh, I didn't have any ad account banned. So for me, it was great. But most of my revenue actually came from Pinterest ads uh, during uh, Black Friday. 
uh, and Cyber Monday and so on. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, it was, it was really good. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't have much to add, but uh, to me, it was thanks to all of these different uh, traffic sources that it really uh, made a difference. More stability, less, an less anxiety, and, and yeah, better result. All right, that's great. Yeah, and then I guess I'll go next. Um, yeah, heading to Q4, everything was fantastic. Um, the results were good, but, you know, going back to the question, how did Black Friday, Cyber Monday go? Mm -hmm. For myself, personally, I tested a ton of offers going into it. But at the same time, once it actually came, I don't know if you guys found this as well, the CPMs were extremely high. Yeah. And I think I need to take a lesson out of your book and try to diversify more. The only thing I was doing with Google ads was just a brand search campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I was doing email marketing, but definitely Pinterest is definitely something I want to look into. But uh, email marketing did did do really well on Black Friday, Saturday, Monday, kind of saved the day. So. Yeah, I know that tends to that you're right that it saves the day many a times yeah. <laughs> when everything else is not profitable. That's where all their profit comes from. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, you're right. I'm I, I'm on the page with you guys. So in my my case, um, I I did find 2019 was more profitable for me. Um, I, I think the challenge is not so much to get sales. You'll get sales. The challenge is to be profitable uh, when you're getting the sales. So that's the main thing. Uh, you know, in the beginning, a lot of people, I know when we all, at least when I started drop shipping, that first catching was a big deal. Oh yeah, I got a sale, but slowly that's not that hard to get. It's more hard being consistently profitable. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I also tried to focus on, on diversification. I was dabbling quite a bit in, um, Twitter ads and native ads as well. Um, and, they're interesting. Like Twitter ads, I was a complete flop for me. Uh, they for for e-commerce at least. So I think it it depends on the niche and angle you're targeting. But didn't work for me for e-commerce. Um, native ads, interestingly, drives a lot of traffic, but not really uh, doesn't convert. So they drive traffic very cheaply uh, at very low CPCs, but they they don't convert. So I you know I think that there's more. I have to experiment more there to figure out how to make that work for e-commerce. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. You, you touched on Twitter, Twitter ads. Yeah. Um, what works on Twitter, like I found and also, I think one of the team members in e-commerce mentoring jazz, shout out jazz. Mm -hmm. She's a killer in Twitter influencer marketing and Twitter influence. Like when you get a tweet that yeah. pops off, yeah. it, the, the traffic that you can drive through website is insane. So Twitter all about being organic. Like no yeah. one uses hashtags anymore. So what you do is relationship products. I don't know if anyone's selling relationship products, but those yeah. kill it. Like being lonely and use memes. And then that <laughs> pops off a lot of people, even any tweet that kind of goes viral, they hit up the influencer and be like, can you promote my product right underneath? Yes. And the amount of traffic that drives is just like every single viral tweet, you'll see a drop shipping product under it in the thread. Yeah, so. I, I think you're right. So what I learned, well, my learning was don't use the Twitter ads platform, like they're, they're parallel of Facebook ads, because that's just like a money, money sink. Um, it's the influencer. So look, kind of do it the way you do on Instagram, look for influencers, talk to them, align them with your product, things like that, as opposed to their native native ads, which didn't do anything for me. Yeah, I agree. That's great. So now, what were some of the, I guess, unexpected challenges that you guys came across? I, I know Yash mentioned the, the bands and all that, but in general, what kind of other challenges did you guys see which were unexpected and how did you guys deal with them in Q4 of last year? So for me personally, I guess just piggybacking off of my last answer, um, some of my biggest challenges was just kind of getting an ad account to write out consistently. Yeah. Uh, that was kind of one of the biggest challenges, like I said, in October, which is kind of one of the most important months in Q4, mm -hmm. at least leading up to Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend. Um, so personally, like I had, I think I ran through like three or four Facebook profiles, uh, like nine business managers, uh, oh, wow. I think like 14 ad accounts, and like six Facebook pages. Um, so it was definitely really, really challenging, but I was um, trying to, again, buy as many profiles as possible, use family and friends as uh, profiles as well. Um, I started to use like multi-logins and proxies uh, just because that was a smarter thing to do. 
And um, unfortunately, like all these bans were happening until the day of Black Friday and that Cyber Monday weekend. Um, so that's why I honestly will, will say I was spending under like a thousand dollars during that weekend. That was like the first time in three years where I was spending such a low budget, but just because of the implications that were present. So yeah. um, I did do a few Instagram influencer shout outs with personal influencers. Mm -hmm. And those turned out to be pretty well in terms of um, ROI. So yeah. Uh, yeah, that's just kind of me personally. Um, there's not much you could have done with the bands and stuff. Yeah. Um, a lot of the times Facebook just bans you randomly. Um, one thing I do recommend still doing is just adhering to the policies, uh, make sure you're following the guidelines and uh, you know, just make sure you have as clean of a history with Facebook as much as possible, if, especially if that's your main form of marketing or advertising. So. Yeah, I was gonna ask that, did you find any common thread uh, which was causing any of these issues that, that you were like, oh, yeah, this is what I was trying to do and now I'll stop doing it. Or, you know, it's not that obvious. Most of the time, maybe yeah. it's random. But just uh, in case you found any common thread that people should avoid. Quite frankly, it was pretty random. Um, I remember like I just created this business manager and then I pressed the create button and the business manager got disabled, right? <laughs> so um something i do recommend is like try and get as many less ads rejected as much as possible because personally like what i've seen is over time it kind of builds up bad rapport or just like a bad pattern with facebook and they mm -hmm. recognize it like if you have 70 ads rejected or like 60 ads rejected within like a week or two yeah. um that might kind of trigger the system to flag your account in some way shape or form so mm -hmm. Um, I've seen that happen over and over again. So I think going back to my point is just make sure you're reading the policies and guidelines and sticking yeah. to them as best as possible. Yeah. Well, yeah. I remember one issue I had, had not this past Q4, but the Q4 before that, um, two, two or three days just before BFCM, uh, PayPal put a hold on my account. Oh, and that was also something to deal with very, very rapidly in like two days. But I, I lucked out there because it's somehow I was right from day one from when I started dropshipping, I was consistently uploading my tracking numbers um, to PayPal. So I think they saw that and they were like a quick request to remove the hold. And within two days, it was it was done. They, they raised the, the limit to five times of what it was. So it, it worked out well, but that was quite a bit of a shocked two days before bfc i was like okay how do i deal with this what do i do what happens to my cash flow <laughs> yeah you yeah, know that is of course very important i mean just uploading tracking info uh to mitigate kind of that chance of you having big holds like i think i still have like is it 45 or 48 thousand on hold with paypal um uh, but i think they have it on hold for another 90 days so i'm just gonna have to wait so, <laughs> yeah yeah how about you jeremy yeah, no, I mean, first thing I want to, I want to agree with what Yash is saying about if you get like a couple of ads rejected in a week, like I just got, I just got one of my accounts banned because of that. So hundred percent agree with that, you know, try to keep, you know, read over the policies and, and if you can stay away from anything that it's going to attribute to someone's physical um, body, like yeah. that is the easiest way to to get banned and i love how you know we're talking about facebook bands and mark's just laughing and doing pinterest ads <laughs> no, but like, but, I've uh, done the same mistakes, man i've done the same thing you know, like, <laughs> i started with facebook ads as well and i still run facebook ads i have nothing against them they're amazing yeah. but if you yeah, that, yeah. with pinterest now but uh yeah i know like i, I miss you about your piece of a piece of skin or whatever like they just they yeah. just buy new extension yeah it's tough it's tough but yeah, any any unexpected challenges, like one of the biggest challenges I had was buying in bulk and and because I was buying in bulk is trying to forecast the amount of stock that I wanted to buy yeah. because I wanted to achieve that balance of not buying too, not buying too much and being left mm -hmm. with it. And also if you buy too much, you know, it kind of hits your cash flow, free ads mm -hmm. and everything. But at the same time, you want to buy enough stock so that you don't run out too quick. So trying to find that balance was it was quite difficult and just trying to forecast as much as possible, tinkering with your ads so you're not scaling too high 
-hmm. but it's always hard when you see that ROAS and just asking you to raise the budget. So yeah, that's yeah, a good, that was, that's that a good nice problem. Challenge. That's a good problem to have though. Seeing it, seeing a good ROAS yeah. and saying, Oh, that's a max budget I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mark, how about you? So uh, me regarding ads, I was pretty lucky. Everything went really smoothly. Um, the only main issue I had um, is I was doing mostly print on demand. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I was selling at different stores, but uh, my, my store uh, bringing the most revenue was about print on demand. And uh, the main issue I had is like, I had a design, uh, it was like a, it was like a um, kind of a Canva, you know, for, for a kitchen. And uh, there was like a cat on it. And uh, this design was a design that I, that I had made by, uh, by my designer. Um, and I knew it was going to sell well because I knew my niche. But for some reason, there was a guy from the internet, an artist, that said that it was his design and mm -hmm. it wasn't mine. And it, was look, it looked like his design, but it didn't at all. So he started spamming uh, you know, all of my pages, everything. Mm -hmm. starting to, it was very, very annoying. Yeah. Uh, but in the end, I mean, I, I, you know, I wasn't, uh, we didn't do anything bad. And it was, uh, we were actually right. But it was, it was just uh, the most annoying thing. I think it was better than you guys. Yeah. <laughs> I was pretty lucky, but still it was, uh, it was a bit stressful. I don't like to be, you know, accused of things like that. And so, yeah, no, fair enough. Thanks for sharing guys. So I guess if we look, change our, our view to forward looking now. So what are you guys planning to do differently this year, 2021 compared to, to last year? What's on the, what's on the menu this year? Definitely more influencers. I know Yash touched on this. He did more TikTok. I think TikTok influencers is so underpriced just because i have friends in the tiktok game and close to a million followers and people and companies are still offering you know i'll give you the product for a free promo mm -hmm. and the fact that they're offering to those people that means it's actually working for other influencers and you'll never ever get away with that on instagram mm -hmm. so 100 tiktok influencers and the best thing about working with influencers is that not only do they promote your product but you use that content on other platforms as well just more content to test and it's organic which is again what is going to be like the trend going forward so right now before we move past that point so in influencer marketing like it's obviously been around but my challenge with influencer marketing has always been how to uh make it scalable right how to make it consistent and scalable like that's the two things uh, that that we get easily with Facebook ads or any normal ads platform, we can scale it whenever you want to. Um, but how do you do you put a system in place where you have a VA, for example, who is sending out 10 messages per day, so it becomes a system and then you, you just kind of do it that way? Or do you have some do you use a influencer manager plat platform of some sort? What's the how do you do that? Well, my strategy is definitely going into the VA route. And, and just messaging as many influencers as possible. Mm -hmm. um, of course, the, the better offer you have, the more, I guess, the more people that agree to work with you. So having that referral program using, you know, the thing that I use is Go Affiliate Pro. So that's been fantastic for me and just giving them a good offer so, because, you know, people are inclined to say no more so on Instagram than TikTok. Yeah. But uh, yeah, definitely having a VA mm -hmm. and just scaling horizontally in that way. Okay, that's great. How about you guys? What's new for this 2021? Um, I think I would also second uh, what Jeremy said, definitely doing more in influencer marketing. Uh, personally, Facebook has always been my bread and butter. Um, so I think with just Facebook being more and more inconsistent, unfortunately, every single day, um, definitely diversifying or kind of going back to influencer marketing. And I say that because Three and a half years ago, I started out with working with influencer pages. That's how I built up that initial capital um, and then transitioned over to Facebook. I used to do like a lot of meme pages and theme pages, uh, you know, kind of back in 2017, 2018. Uh, but recently I've been starting to work with more personal influencers as well. Um, like recently, if you guys know the rapper Lil Baby, um, I worked like, I think it's like his girlfriend or just his partner. Um, I also worked with like a few other influencers with like a few million followers. So that's been going pretty well. And kind of what you touched upon, Shishir, like making it consistent. I think it's hard to make it 
consistent in terms of like having an influencer post every single day. I mean, realistically you could, but I think um, like, for example, making it scalable, what I used to do is like, I'd get like seven or eight theme pages and like, I'd basically stack them between like two days or between even three or four days sometimes. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's something I've seen people doing um, I've also stacked like micro influencers, like during Black Friday, Cyber Monday weekend, like I'll have, you know, two on Friday, two on Saturday, and like three or four on Monday, because it's Cyber Monday, obviously. Right. So um, I think overall, just continue doing what I'm doing, you know, learning strategies, trying new strategies with, with uh, Facebook at least, and then kind of falling a little bit back on influencer marketing, because I think it can be great like Jeremy said, to reuse that content for your website, for social yeah. media, for advertisement. It's also great to build like that kind of that social awareness or just that branding awareness in general. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I think that's what I would uh, probably start doing more of in 2021 and onwards. That's great. So. Uh, me, uh, it's more about outsourcing and uh, hiring, more pe hiring more people as well. You know, like I agree with all of your points. Um, but the thing is, my, my main issue is I was um, kind of outgunned. I didn't have enough people to uh, and uh, enough um, employees to, uh, to do a bit of everything, you know, to do influencer marketing, to do TikTok, to do uh, mm -hmm. Twitter, to do everything. And that's my main mistake. And I, and I see, uh, I think it was just because when I started, I was pretty much doing everything myself with just a few people. Um, and I got used to that, but that's the main yeah. mistake. And I think next year, I mean, this year, uh, what I'm going to do is grow exponentially by, by uh, you know, hiring, hiring more people and outsourcing um, and having more consistency. For me, it's not really consistency, you know, day by day, but probably more uh, months by month. Mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously using influencers, using, um, like I said, Pinterest, Facebook, yeah. pretty much every single uh, traffic sources, but with a very strong team that I can rely on. Um, and that's the main challenge, my, my main goal for this year to be more organized and, and yeah, have mm -hmm. like a stronger team in place. Yeah, I think that's a very big challenge for, for many of us, uh, for me personally, at least, because we've all grown, so, we've grown from ground up doing everything ourselves. And, and that, that's, I think, the biggest challenge for any entrepreneur to, to, to believe that somebody else can do it as good as you can. Uh, and oftentimes th that's not the case, uh, but you have to be OK with that. Uh, that you know somebody else doing it at 90 percent it's still okay because it frees up your time to do other things uh you know so it's a big challenge that i struggle with all the time as well so you know good on you mark for trying to trying to get that up um now looking forward again so what kind of niches and market areas do you guys think are coming to trend in 2021 i know obviously 2019 was all of, in in the beginning was all about fitness products and all those kind of things what kind of things do you focus on this year? Yeah, I think things to make your home look nicer. That's mm -hmm. just going to continue because everyone is just spending more time at home than ever. I think a lot of companies are moving just fully remote. So yeah. anything to make your home office look better, um, things to make you more productive, you know, that those lights just killed it um, last year. Mm -hmm. and, and that's fantastic. And then, Mark, I know you, you touched on print on demand. I think print on demand is going to be fantastic as well, especially the gift giving niche, just because, you know, we haven't seen, I, I know that, I don't know for you guys, but I haven't seen certain members of my family in a long time. So being able to show love through print on demand products, you know, those, mm. those prints on mugs, like uh, Creative Fabrica, getting those, getting those people on the mugs and getting the names there is just, it's going to do really well. Yeah. Good angle. Exactly. Yeah. I think, um, like items or products that you can personalize or customize, uh, you know, whether it be print on demand, getting something engraved or stitched on in specific, whatever it really may be, just personalized and customized products in general. I also made like a video last week on my channel. That's um, kind of a category I also included. And then also just kind of home improvement and home decor products. I think they're so widely targetable. They're so mass approachable. Um, and they have a very wide reach to them as well, because mm -hmm. almost everyone has some sort of living space, uh, you know, whether it be a house or a condo or apartment, whatever mm -hmm. it really may be. And I think um, as more and more people are working from home, staying home, 
uh, you know, they, they want to buy products that, you know, make their house or their, their rooms look nicer, uh, maybe help them with a specific task or solve a problem, whether it be, you know, in their kitchen or their basement, I don't know, whatever it really may be. So I think that's definitely an area that's also growing. Um, I think also personal and self-care products, uh, health and wellness products, which I know have a little bit of a twist when it comes to Facebook ads, because uh, yeah. like those kind of products, you kind of have to showcase a lot of adverts that include like body parts and whatnot. I know Facebook can be a little strict with that, um, mm -hmm. just like how Jeremy was saying, but I think that's an ever growing niche or niche because um, I think people are always dealing with some sort of problem or issue when it comes to their body. And I feel like people are always going to invest into themselves or for their body, you know, whether it be to make them feel better or to increase their confidence or whatever it really may be. So yeah. I think those three areas I'm going to be focusing on more at least this year. Mm -hmm. That's great. One thing I can suggest is, uh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. sorry, sorry. Yeah. One thing, one thing that came to mind was also uh, just, just kids, right? So children even, and this is a bit more location specific, but, but I know, for example, in, in Toronto and parts of Ontario, schools are closed again. Um, so, you know, kids are at home, you need stuff to distract them with, you need, you need stuff to keep them occupied, keep them educated, even though they're not, you know, going, going actively to schools. So again, that that kind of niche is still there. Educational toys for kids uh, that that will still continue to be there. I think as long as COVID's around for a while. Yeah, and that was one of the things that I sold last year when the pandemic hit. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, if anyone watching this does want to go into the educational toys niche, just make sure your shipping time is fantastic because everyone's in lockdown. Everyone's antsy and they want it yeah. now. So. <laughs> Don't use AliExpress or use a good AliExpress supplier or, you know, get any other supplier that can give you eight to 15 days shipping time because mm -hmm. you don't want to deal with those angry customers that are locked at home and very antsy. Angry parents, especially. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, Mark. Go ahead. No worries. Uh, I think mental health is going to be big, you know, because people mm -hmm. are locked down at home. Um, and there's a lot of depressed people nowadays, you know, because of the fact that they can't go out, they can't go to restaurants. So I think products that can help mental health, uh, that can really make them feel better, uh, like like uh, you said before, more confident and so on, is going to be huge. Um, obviously, like you guys said, home and cooking, people are going to cook more. So a lot of cooking gadgets are going to sell well. Uh, home mm -hmm. decor, actually, like I said, one of my biggest stores is about uh, home, uh, home decor and cooking. So it works really well. Um, and also relationship, obviously everything relationships, a uh, gift for girlfriends, wives, I mean, it always worked to be honest, uh, yeah. you know, niche that always worked, but I think this year it's going to be even, even bigger for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now, one thing I wanted to quiz your quiz you guys on was, was, so we have a uh, Chinese year coming up in just about a week or so. Uh, and many of the factories are in China are shutting down. So I know some of us are already at a point where we are focused more on buying inventory ahead of time, bringing it to, to the U S or whichever market you focus on and then fulfilling it from there. But again, many of our viewers may not be at that stage yet. They're still using AliExpress, you know, and many of us still do use the, use that for our testing products. Um, so how do you guys typically deal with uh, the, the three to four week, you know, blackout? Of, of supply from from um, from AliExpress. <clears throat> yeah, so there's like four ways that you can kind of get around this issue. It's keep business as usual, keep selling, but make sure that you set the expectation on every part of your funnel. So on the Facebook ads, say there's a pre-order. Your mm -hmm. call to action, change the language or edit language on Shopify to yeah. a pre-order button. And then on your shipping, instead of just saying free standard shipping, say, pre-order, you know, and then whatever shipping time you expect. Another solution is um, stop selling and create a bunch of products so that when Chinese New Year is over, just pump them all out. Mm -hmm. Another one is selling digital products. And right. um, another one is use suppliers in the USA. For example, Spocket, shout out Mark. I know you have a good relationship with those guys. <laughs> and um, AliExpress, you know, if they have a US warehouse, US warehouse, and then, you know, anyone else that has stock in the U.S. So 
those are yeah. kind of four ways that you can mitigate any issues that come with Chinese New Year. Yeah, I think you've already covered it all there. <laughs> but <laughs> anything else you guys uh, don't normally try? Yeah, I think Jeremy basically covered it all. I mean, those are some great points. Um, one thing I've seen people do, and it really, really, really depends on the product and also where you're shipping from and to, is fulfilling from eBay. Um, I know there's a few gray areas in there, but uh, it's definitely possible to do. Um, I would also say if you're doing like at least 10 or 15 orders a day, I know um, a lot of people also utilize private agents. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, worst comes to worst, um, you know, you're, you may be back ordered for like seven days, nine days, 10 days, because there's only a specific period of time where it overlaps for everyone. I know for some factories and manufacturers, it's different, you know, I think one or two weeks, give or take, uh, whether it be being uh, longer or shorter. Uh, but overall, just be very communicative and very clear with your customers. At the end of the day, like if it's a product that your customer doesn't need right away, I think he or she will be okay to wait as long as they're assured. And as long as, you know, your customer service is on point, like, you know, have post-purchase email flows, um, you know, have, have it clear in your shipping policies, have it clear on your product page. Um, I think as long as you're transparent, um, pretty much you should be okay. Me personally, I have one store that's fulfilling from a 3PL in the United States and uh, from uh, Tampa, Florida. And uh, I think my private agent for two of my other stores will only not be working for about six or seven days. So I'll only be back ordered for about a week, uh, which again, I don't think will be too big of a deal. And it all comes down to just having, you know, clear communication with your uh, customers. Yeah, communication is the, is the key point. Mark, anything to add to that? Uh, yeah, well, Jeremy obviously said uh, almost everything. But um, me, when I started, I used Etsy a lot um, mm -hmm. without using Spocket, actually. I was just reaching out to uh, suppliers right away on Etsy, just sending them a you know, normal message, ask them about uh, their product, the fact that I like them, that I want to advertise uh, on Facebook and different um, traffic sources. And most of them will say yes, and then they will give you a discount, can start at 20%, and, and then they give you better discounts you know, when you get more sales. Uh, so that's in one option. Uh, the other option is obviously print on demand. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, this is, it works really well. Obviously the suppliers are either in Europe or in the, in the, um, in the US when you use, uh, you know, the biggest, yeah. the big uh, print on demand supplier, like um, Printify, Printful and so on. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have very good shipping times. So usually I get, I have really good results during, um, you know, during Chinese New Year. Because, uh, because, yeah, there's less competition and uh, a lot of people are buying actually products from, uh, you know, print on demand products. So it works really well, really well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. all good points, guys. Um, now, the next topic I had here was, was the big news we've all seen and read about um, iOS 14. So how, again, for, for folks who are, who are involved with Facebook ads, and I think this will impact other ad platforms as well over time, but how are you guys dealing with that is there anything you're changing in your approach um, as a result of of the lack of tracking um let's say that will be you know that will impact facebook ads attribution going down the road are you making any changes if at all uh, what are you guys doing about it mark why don't you get started on this one um, so for me i didn't see it yet so far i didn't have any uh, negative impact yeah. Uh, but the thing is, I'm not scared at all. For me, it's a just it's a new opportunity. Yeah. Uh, if it stops working, then obviously we'll find a ways. I think we can always target only Android devices and not uh, iOS, uh, or otherwise just use different traffic sources. I'm really not worried. Uh, obviously, it's a bit too soon to say exactly what's mm -hmm. going to happen. I know some people told me that they had like some. Um, some uh, they already had like some uh, decrease in the in the results and so on but it wasn't the case for me using facebook ads and instagram ads so uh we'll see but like i said i think uh, just targeting androids uh devices and using traffic sources is is the way to go for sure yeah 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 i mean my my view on that my at least ob observation so far is first of all like you said it'll take some time to roll out um, because ios like i think on average six months to a year is when people start upgrading to the new new os uh, so it'll take some time to show, uh, but even if it does impact the the you know people using iPhones, ultimately 
the bottom line is as long as your creative is good, your product is good, your offer is good, it's, it'll still deliver, right? The, the main, because your customers are still seeing the ads. The main thing is, yes, they may not report back as accurately to Facebook as they used to. But if, yeah. you're, if your bottom line creatives and offers are good, it shouldn't really have much of an impact on your bottom line. Just, yeah. you, you'll just have trouble attributing it to the source. Um, which you know, I think many of us already see that only about maybe 70% of our sales on Shopify make it, uh, you know, are, sh- are showing up on Facebook anyway. And probably mm. that number just grows, um, you know, and may impact retargeting and things like that. But again, I don't see it as big of a deal, like you said, but what are, what are your thoughts, Jeremy or Yash? Yeah, um, I, I'm not doing anything differently currently, but I think in the future, I believe lookalikes will lose its effectiveness. And I think doing proper, so before it was all about just pick an interest or don't even pick an interest and just launch your ads. And now I think going granular and picking proper interest and picking interests not in the normal way, way that you would do it. So when you hit the suggestions tab, it shows the same 20, 20 to 25 interests for every single person. So diving a little bit deeper using different tools such as Interest Explorer or using Facebook Audience Insights, looking at the similar pages with high affinity and going that way. Um, I think using interest targeting and, and being really granular is gonna be the trend when this iOS hits and the algorithm might not be as strong, so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, thanks for sharing. I know you had shared that in the, com- in the Slack community as well, yeah. so that's quite useful, good tip. Yeah, so just to give my two cents, I think, uh, you know, you three gentlemen gave all really, really good points, but just to chime in really quick, I'll say that this game is about the survival of the fittest. I think you have to just adapt and pivot and not be intimidated. Uh, You know, stuff like this is always going to change, like major changes like these are always going to change or or at least come every few years. So. I think as long as you have a proper strategy and you know what you're doing and you're open to implementing feedback into action, Mm -hmm. um, I think you should be okay. So I haven't been doing anything too, too, too different. One thing I noticed, and I'm not sure if you guys also noticed this, that I couldn't see my purchases on the campaign level. Mm -hmm. I can only see them at the asset level. Um, So just little things like that. but really nothing too crazy. You know, as long as you're able to adapt and pivot as necessary, you know, you'll be okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, all these little quirks keep on coming, coming along with Facebook every few months. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't agree more with, uh, with uh, what Yash said, like, um, like you said, it's all about adapting and overcoming, uh, you know, problems and and just finding new, um, new solutions and so on. So that's Mm -hmm. the main thing about business, you know, survive, like you said, survival of the fittest, and I, I agree 100%. I actually made a video about it, uh, like about just not worrying and just um, it's going to be a new opportunity for people. Even if, like, let's say Facebook dies tomorrow, which obviously is not the case, um, the better marketer will find another way of targeting, of, of using, you know, different traffics also to make money. And then you actually yeah. get an edge over all your competitors. So it's, uh, it's, mm-hmm. um, it's always, for me, it's actually an opportunity uh, rather than, uh, than a problem. And also one last thing is like, it's a big problem for Facebook. So I think they will, uh, if it really has a negative impact on advertising, I think they will find a way to track uh, that data better or just find a way to make uh, advertising better because for them, it's a huge, huge problem. That's why they're putting all of this bullshit about saving small businesses and stuff yeah. and you know, like a fight against Apple. This is, this, this is so yeah. stupid, yeah. but it's true. Like I, I, so I'm, yeah, like I said, I think we shouldn't be worried at all. Yeah, I, I, one one good uh, sort of uh, quote or whatever, you know, over the New Year's, whenever New Year comes around, you get all these quotes about what, you know, goal setting and things like that. And yeah. one of the good ones was was all about how, you know, I, I wish you a happy New Year and I wish you bigger and better problems to solve. You know, so that's like from a business standpoint, that's a good way to look at it. You know, you're going to always have problems, even when you move to the next level of sales, you will have problems, just a different type or set of problems. And you'll be rewarded more for, for solving them. <laughs> so, you know, problems are not something to shy away from. I like uh, that. I really, I really like that. Yeah. So now on ad creatives. So let's, again, this is, again, not specific to Facebook ads, but across the different app platforms, 
what evolutions have you seen in ad creative strategy uh, and where do you see it going for 2021? What kind of uh, things are you going to be focusing on when producing ad creatives for, for e-com products? Um, I think just to give... Yeah, go ahead, bro. Go ahead. You sure? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah um, no, you good. I think talking to more like a beginner audience, I would say like, I think just coming across as authoritative and is more important now, making your creatives as clean as possible, especially ad copy. Like when we're talking about like 2014, 15, 16, 17, even 18 e-commerce dropshipping, like using five or 10 emojis, all that stuff used to work, um, you know, but it really doesn't anymore. Like consumers are very picky as to where they want to buy from now. Um, at least that's what I've started to notice in 2021 and onward. So, you know, making sure like copy is as clean as possible. I've seen that shorter copy is working better in, in most cases than longer copy. Um, I think it's also because these social media platforms are getting flooded with more and more types of content. Uh, people's attention spans are also getting shorter by the day, especially now because people are on social media more. So just really making it clean, simple, and congruent. Mm -hmm. um, again, kind of going back to my point on talking to like a beginner audience, um, you know, stop being lazy, like stop taking videos from other competitors. Stop just literally downloading videos and pasting them and using them. Like I see so many people literally use videos that have watermark from, from, a, from another store. You know, like <laughs> yeah. if you're that lazy, like I can almost promise you that you're not going to go too far. Um, Facebook loves custom content, custom mm -hmm. creatives, fresh, new, recycled content every now and then. Um, now, I'm not saying that every product you test, you have to get custom content, but, you know, go ahead and, you know, make a video yourself or if you're not adequate or proficient in video editing, you know, use another third party company to make a custom video, at least right with different background music make sure it's HD, make sure it fits a one by one ratio. It has a nice mm -hmm. thumbnail, uh, maybe some captions. So, and you know, once you have something working, I would definitely in encourage to actually get custom content. Um, you know, that works really, really well. Again, going back to my point, how Facebook really favors original content, fresh new content. So, yeah. um, you know, be minimal, be clean, be congruent, make sure you're copy and your creatives really resonate and speak to your potential customer and it all kind of goes back to knowing buyer and buyer and audience persona who your potential and ideal customer really is so mm -hmm. that's just yeah. my little take on it yeah. i agree 100 percent with yash like i want to touch on the whole the minimalistic portion that you talked about I actually split tested ad copy versus no ad. You're saying ad, short ad copy worked well. I tested no long, ad. short, no ad copy. And I te split tested it for two weeks because I did not believe the results. And no ad copy actually did better. Now it might be different for wow. different niches that you're testing. Yeah, it might be different for different niches. But like I, I legit, I did not stop the split test because I did not believe the results. And mm -hmm. after two weeks, the, the results were staggering. And I was like, okay, no copy to scale. A lot of and copywriters then, are losing their jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or the, yeah, yeah, pretty much. Um, but, and then going out with what kind of, what kind of um, creatives you're going to go for hundred percent. Like if you can take a saturated product and send it to a YouTube influencer, which is something that I've done and get that content, like that is just really good content to use. Like you said, recycling, refresh, refreshing content. That's like the best way to do it. That's great. Anything to add, Mark? Yeah, you guys said it all. But to me, it's always been like less is more. Uh, like you guys said, having a clean, clean image, uh, HD content and so on. For mm -hmm. print on demand, um, it's all about mockups, for example. And um, what I see people doing is pretty much like stealing a video. They steal um, a picture that somebody, um, you know, like the, the ad from somebody, some, from another competitor without changing anything. And even if it's just, a mock-up, it's not a video. It has a huge impact. If you change the mock-up, you have something completely different. Um, and like I said, a lot of people are really lazy. I mean, like um, like Yash said, people are lazy. 
um, and they don't really try to find the right mock-up for the product, you know? So sometimes um, if it's going to be, I don't know, a um, poster or Canva about uh, an astronaut or something, they're gonna have the poster with a mock-up in a room or, or something. Me, I'm gonna try to find a very uh, specific uh, mock-up that is linked to the to the design so maybe with uh you know i don't know like a, a space shuttle on the side or something like this just to to really um to go really deep and it, it works really really well like just doing this uh, works well um another thing also uh, that's a trick i use many times um for relationship products for canvas and poster as well sometimes you find a product that is for boyfriends you know it's a gift for boyfriends it works really well um, or just for like girlfriends. What I do is I just make it for other people, like for wives or for husbands. And uh, this, just this, just this uh, very uh, simplistic change um, have a really big effect because people don't think about it. But you just mm -hmm. take something that is working, you just change, uh, you know, a bit the narrative, and then it works pretty well. Yeah, Mark, for for um, mockups. So for print on demand specifically, do you use place it? Place, uh, place, it, place it is a very place it, yeah. Uh, yeah have you used it before yeah yeah i've used it i've used yeah. it uh, well my date my designer uh uses a different thing i'm no expert okay. in this i just know what i want and then i you know i go for it in the beginning i was just starting i was doing it myself yeah. um and the thing is you can actually find free mock-ups that are really good and are pretty you know close to the design you want to sell uh, mm -hmm. without paying anything um and it works again it, it, it works fine it's just people are so lazy they use the same thing that everybody are using uh mm -hmm. you can even do some time when you can't find a mock-up i I've, i know that i've been using photoshop just to photoshop a design on a, a normal picture but if you do it cleanly uh and nobody can actually see it and it's done well yeah. uh it, it works as well you know you just need to do a clean job and not be lazy and and, and uh, yeah, yeah. No, I just brought that up just because I, I found that to be a really good tool. Uh, and yeah, the amount of resources they have on that one site, it's quite uh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, it's unbelievable that the amount of uh, stuff you can produce from there. Um, my only challenge sometimes is the kind of thing, the mock-up you're looking for may not be available in their menu. But if it's more of a standard kind of a print-on-demand product, then more than likely you'll find something that you can you can mock up on place it itself. Um, yeah. Yes, were you about to say something? Yeah, I think um, since we're on the point of uh, just kind of add a copy, add a creatives, add text, um, I see one thing a lot of beginners do is putting all their eggs in one creative or one type of creative. Um, a lot of people are just so attained of using videos, 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 mm -hmm. videos. Um, videos are no doubt great. Um, it definitely makes sense for products that need a lot of unfolding or a lot of demonstration or um, if people really need to be educated behind a certain product then yeah go ahead and use a video uh, but for example if, if you're selling something more self-explanatory like apparel or jewelry or something that's more simple doesn't need that unfolding behind it try to also split test you know single image ads maybe just have a nice single image with a border around it some text Maybe have one image and make it into a collage with two or three or four different pictures. Uh, use carousel ads, you know. So just don't basically put all your eggs into that one creative or one type of creative. Get into the practice of utilizing and making these different types of creatives as well. Um, again, I know like most dropshipping products may need a video to really get that selling part done, uh, but it's really not the case in all types of dropshipping products like. I've had single image ads perform way better than video ads for certain types of products before. So just mm -hmm. kind of putting that out there too. No, yeah. I agree, man. Like with, uh, especially when times are tough on Facebook, CPMs are high, pictures yeah. of your best friend and, and testing everything. Like I know Shashir posted on the dropshipping council, that pie chart, you know, the percentage of users that uh, I think, I don't know if they're shown video, they're shown mm -hmm. picture, they're shown carousel and other. So like, yeah. I mean, put that right there and, and uh, you'll see how many people like carousels and pictures. So 100%, yeah, split test everything. Yeah, the For placement sure. inventory, basically. Like there's dedicated placement inventory from Facebook mm -hmm. where customers who don't interact with videos, let's say, uh, don't get shown video ads. They get shown image ads more. Uh, so if you're only advertising with videos, you're missing 30% of the entire Facebook inventory. 
Um, so, you know, you, you, Facebook will only show image ads to those people because that's what they like or interact with. Uh, so you're bang on. I think you always got to have at least three types of creatives, not just, you know, multiple videos, but have at least a video, at least a carousel and at least an image to, to in all their testing campaigns and scaling campaigns. Um, yeah. That's great. Now, a little bit on sort of the post uh, post ads and marketing. So I'm talking about messenger marketing, text marketing, web push marketing. How have you guys uh, utilized that in the past and, and how do you see that changing going forward? This is basically anything, anything and everything to bump up your, your average order value, right? So um, how are you guys utilizing those tools uh, going forward? Um, I guess I'll go ahead and cover some simple things on the surface because I know a lot of beginners may be watching this. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say first and foremost, like a lot of people only depend on the front end revenue, whether that be from Facebook, Google, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, kind of their main advertising platform or platforms that sell front end revenue, mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, kind of from their direct response marketing. But I think a lot of people neglect and or overlooked uh, their backend revenue, right, from emails and from text messages. So I think just on a simple basis, having abandonment cart email sequences being sent out. Um, I personally send out like three abandonment cart email sequences after someone, you know, stops actually checking out or again, abandons their cart. So having that in place, you know, you can use apps like abandonment protector or Clavio, um, and then just having also SMS sequences in place as well. Mm -hmm. um, for me, SMS has actually been working a little bit better than email lately. Yeah. Um, I think just because more and more people are being attained to checking their texts more frequently now, just how the digital age is moving, or it could be some other factors too. I don't really know, but that's what I've really seen. Um, also, like for make abandoned, sure you, for abandoned carts, I I've always seen text messages work better than email uh, in terms. Yeah, of yeah, yeah, for sure. And I, I think one what also people neglect is like what like let's say you scale a store like at least with traditional drop shipping and that product dies out after a month, three months, four months. You know, use all of those customer emails. Like those are all assets of your store. Like I scaled a store. Uh, in October and November, and I, I have a list of like 40,000 customer emails. Um, I'm literally doing like two to three K in revenue per day, just by sending out email flows every single week with like literally 60% profit margin. So I think a lot of people also forget that, that once you do scale a store, um, you know, you have these assets to also utilize as well. So again, that's just kind of covering some beginner phases on top of the surface but if uh, mark and jeremy have something more concrete in terms of like systems and stuff they have in place go ahead jeremy yeah well i think you know touching on the whole messenger versus email like it just makes sense why messenger is better you know you can't really land in a spam box on your phone mm -hmm. and people are just way more accustomed to checking sms um their text message um I just want to shout out a crazy app that that I love to use. And this is just going towards a whole organic uh, type of advertising, which is, it's called TextCart. I don't have an affiliate link or anything. I just really like it because it, what it uses, they say it's real people, but I believe it's just AI that's talking to your customers. So right. when you abandon your cart, they, it's like you're talking to your buddy and you forgot something. So I, in my opinion and in my experience, I found that that works so much better than something like SMS bump where you're just sending campaigns where you know you know it's automated. But with TextCart, it's personalized and it's just casual. So yeah, it's definitely something that I really like to use. Good tip. How about you, Mark? She's writing down your your app yeah. too. <laughs> sounds interesting. <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah. For me, I, I focus a lot on on, on text marketing, uh, obviously because the uh, the open rate is is just insane. Um, and um, I don't know. It, I just it's true that I don't actually focus uh, on emails enough. Um, I do have somebody doing it, but I just it's something I need to focus more on this year. It's definitely huge. Um, it's undervalued and and, and it's amazing. 
um, regarding um, SMS. I wanted to say something. I kind of had the idea when uh, both my <laughs> I forgot. Yeah. But uh, yeah, just go ahead, guys. I'm just gonna, it's gonna come back. I just wanted to say something, but um, just, no just forgot. To yeah. So yeah. one 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 thing that that uh, I learned from a masterclass that uh, Nick Nick Romaya at Recart had done for the council members um, in terms of getting new subscribers, right? So I think most of us have at least one pop up on our web pages, which which is either for you know their phone number or for their email to get them a discount and things like that. And what Nick showed, showed was with Messenger, what happens is if you use um, a, the re, a, a recart pop-up to collect, so the first thing you're collecting is just the Messenger subscription, right? You're just saying subscribe to get a 5% discount, whatever. Now the guy, the customer goes on to their, opens up their Messenger app. And then in there, you have an automated bot sequence that then asks them for their email and their phone number. And you can almost have a discount ladder and say, hey, do you want another 5% off if you give us your phone number? And, and for them, it's all just one touch because Facebook auto-populates their email and phone number. So they don't even have to type it out. So within like three clicks, literally, or three touches, they have given you their messenger subscription, their email, and their phone number. So you've, you've signed up for three different lists essentially uh through that three three touch points and the customer is back on onto the page and then you can incentivize them obviously with incremental discounts if you want to do that um, and i thought that's a very effective way to to do to get those subscribers initially as opposed to having one subscriber for email one for messenger in the bottom right and that just like clutters up your page um just uh, have any have any of you guys tried that before but that's that's what I learned from from Recart. That's a, an ability that they offer that they because they they integrate with SMS Bump with Clavio on the back end. So any right. emails that are inputted into the um, Messenger pop up, they populate your Clavio list. They populate your text marketing list as well. So, yeah. um, did you get your thread mark that you're thinking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, when, one thing that works really well for me is um, abundant, abundant um, cart recovery on WhatsApp. You know, there's a lot of apps um, on uh, on Shopify for that, and it works really well because again, it's it's you know it's pretty much SMS and everybody yeah. checks the WhatsApp all the time, and this this, this works well. So you go, I mean, it's almost like harassment, obviously, when you do like um, Messenger um, SMS. Yeah. Then messenger. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it works but, but it works so that's the that's the that's the goal yeah that's interesting i'll look that up as well yeah you know whatsapp that's that's a really interesting one that's cool man thanks for that <laughs> so that's i think cool. to, to uh, yeah thanks Scott. Yeah. yeah to wrap up i guess so just in general in terms of like broader scaling strategies um you know let's say you're you're now at a stage where yes you have uncovered a few good products that that have tested well that, that are you know profitable and you are now in the phase where you want to pump money into this um wh what are your different go-to scaling strategies on facebook on pinterest or, or on any other platform that you guys utilize jeremy why don't you go for it yeah well i, I would like my bread and butter is facebook yeah um scaling strategies there's a lot of them, man. Like, yeah, for, you want to test everything. That's like the underlying principle to scaling is test every audience and test every strategy out there because depending, literally depending on your ad account, depending mm -hmm. on your niche, depending on your product, you never know what's going to work. Maybe broad targeting works really well for you, or maybe you have, maybe lookalikes works really well for you. In my case, in November, I did interest targeting and scaled to five to 10 K with just interests. And when you find the right interests, you know, they can hit. And I, this is something that I talk about in, in um, the Kings and Queens Facebook group, which is instead of looking for interests that di directly correspond to your niche, look for interests that correspond to your end user. So if you're selling to older people, don't, don't do like old age and stuff like that. Look at the TV shows that yeah. they watch like one of the interests that killed it for me was house like the tv show house i don't know if you guys have heard of it 
something else, Netflix, like just testing everything is the best way to scaling Facebook ads, um, different percentages on look likes yeah. and, and just really everything, man. And, and of course, retargeting, um, mm -hmm. testing three different types of retargeting. I believe it's um, objecting handling, scarcity, mm -hmm. and uh, a testimonial type of ad. Um, testing UGC picture ads like like there's so much I can talk about yeah but uh yeah you just want to test everything that's like the underlying principle mm -hmm. watch a bunch of YouTube videos and try everything and mark it off if it doesn't and if it does pour money into it yeah and the key thing is like you said there's no consistency whatsoever what worked for one product may not work for the other one so you got to almost start from scratch <laughs> and start testing everything again for the next yeah year. and i scaled across two different ad accounts and something that worked for ad account a didn't work mm -hmm. for ad account b so you just <laughs> you just yeah. never know yeah 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 i think that was really spot on uh people also have to know that every ad account has a different personality a different dna just like how jeremy said like me and jeremy can have the same store the same product set up everything the same way in terms of our product page funnel interest targeting everything and he can have a four row ass in three days i can have like a 1.79 in three days you know mm -hmm. so uh, just being open to implementing feedback into action I, I know i said this before but i think a lot of people are so submerged into just going one way and quite frankly there is no one right or wrong way like yes the principle base and foundation is pretty much the same but um, it's always different for everybody. Um, and yeah, if you do find like the right interest, just like Jeremy said, like I've literally scaled to 10K days just with interest. And that was all from just two campaigns. It was mm -hmm. uh, one open broad targeting campaign um, at an ABO level. And the other one was like my top performing uh, CBO ad sets. Um, I think I had like five or six ad sets in that CBO. So um, and then just like Jeremy said, I guess it's a little bit repetitive, but test everything, test every type of custom audience, every type of lookalike. Um, usually I'll start out by doing like 75% video watchers, 95% video watchers. Um, I know there's also 25 and 50%, but I usually won't touch them or I'll maybe even come back to them later on. Mm -hmm. um, I'll also do like 10 second video viewers or video watchers, uh, view content, website visitors, um, then I'll probably go into like add to cart, initiate checkout, add payment info, purchase. Yeah. Sometimes I'll do like value based lookalikes as well, depending on who my customers are, from what country, what type of products I'm selling. And then, you know, just test every single pocket. Like mm -hmm. literally start by 1%, go from one to two, two <laughs> to three, three to four, all the way to 10, you know, then do like yeah. One to three, three to five, five to seven, two to four, yeah. four to six, six to eight, you know, zero to two, zero to three, zero to four. So again, there's like endless possibilities. Seven like days, beauty... 15 days, 30 days. <laughs> exactly. Like play around with like, like that's what exactly what Jeremy said. Like I'll start out by doing 180 days and let's say like five to 6%, 75% video watchers uh, do really well. Then I'll do like 90 days and like, yeah. 30 days and 60 days. So yeah. I kind of play around with that. Um, I'll also do like a lot of breakdowns. Um, like sometimes once I have an ample amount of purchases per ad set, I'll break it down by, you know, age, gender, country, placement, mm -hmm. uh, placement, platform, mm -hmm. uh, device, so on and so forth. So that's something you could consider doing as well. Sometimes it won't work well, sometimes it will. Um, bottom line, just like Jeremy said, all comes down to testing. And, uh, you know, don't be emotionally attached to any sort of new campaign or anything. Just let the data and, and the numbers do the speaking and the talking for you. And, uh, you know, it'll be good. So, yeah. Sorry. One more thing before, before Mark, sorry, um, is that when you're scaling, it's so important to segment your audiences. So when you're hitting your cold traffic, a lot of people don't do this, but exclude your website visitors, yeah. because if you see inconsistencies, it's because your cold campaigns are hitting your middle of funnel people. So you got to exclude those website visitors. And one more thing, I totally forgot. Mark, you can go ahead. <laughs> I had one more thing, but I forgot. Okay. Uh, well, you guys covered Facebook ads, so I'll talk about, about Pinterest a bit. But for Pinterest, it's, for interest, it's, a, it's the same. You have to test every single interest. There's less choices on Facebook, so it's actually easier. 
but the main thing about Pinterest is actually keywords. And uh, keywords is actually crazy because sometimes you find the perfect keyword for your product. Like for example, it's a poster for kid. You're gonna get you know you're gonna have kid poster. Uh, you say oh it's gonna work amazingly. Actually, it doesn't work at all. And then you have another uh, keyword that is just going to be completely unrelated, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a home run. It's gonna work amazingly. Uh, it's just going to be crazy, you know. And it's just that's that's it's all about testing. I, st I usually start with 25, 50 keywords that are pretty generic. The first keywords that pops, uh, pops up on the suggestion uh, you know, list. And then um, I start testing different things that have nothing to do with my product sometimes. So for example, it's a cat product. I'm going to go for panda keywords. I'm going to go for uh, squirrels, anything that, you know, cute animals and things like this. And sometimes you're going to have uh, a keyword again that's unrelated is going to work extremely well. Uh, so the other thing about Pinterest, you have to be obviously patient because it's not like Facebook keywords. It takes time, you know, to optimize. It takes time to, to get like a good amount of traffic. But when you do, um, it's super powerful because you can get profit and traffic for years. Like I have a product that I've launched uh, almost two years ago and I'm still getting profit every single day with this campaign that I didn't touch. You know, this is almost impossible uh, with Facebook ads. So that's huge. Uh, and that's just because of, thanks to keywords, you know, it's just mm -hmm. like, it is super targeted and it works really well. That's great. One, one thing I just wanted to emphasize is, or, or not emphasize, but put in perspective is when, whenever I reach a stage where, you know, I'm ready to really scale a product, it's proven itself. Um, I'll try to mentally make sure like a, a good guideline is most, very of us, many of us get tempted into spending all of our time inside the ads manager. Uh, you know, you're just living there, you're creating, you're multiplying your audiences, you're setting up campaigns, duplicating this, duplicating that. Uh, but I, the way I always try to almost try to make sure I spend, you know, 50% of your time, sure, do all that inside the ads manager, but spend another 50% of your time on your product, on your offer, on your product page, right? If you, if you have had your initial offer and product work and get some traction, then put in the time before you start scaling to make that offer even more attractive, like make the offer, test different offers, different types of discounts, test, you know, new headline images on your product page, uh, improve your copy, create a, an offer stack. Like Peter Pru talks a lot about this, create a effective offer stack, give them free value, right? Um, so that, that your offer becomes undeniable why they should choose to buy from Amazon or you is because, hey, your offer stack is better. Uh, you know, a simple example is if you're selling an item that is, uh, you know, that takes some skill, let's say, to use properly, okay? Uh, it's very much in your interest to give them free content along with it, which helps them to use it more effectively, like a tutorial of some sort, right? Because not only does it increase the perceived value of the product, but it'll lower your return rate because your, your customers are using the product more effectively. They'll be happier, you know? So think about how to, how to build up that offer stack uh, as part of your scaling efforts because you, you're going to bump up your conversion rates. Uh, you know, whatever was not profitable or, or was break even before will become profitable. So spend 50% of your time on product stuff and then the remaining 50 in, inside your ads manager. Yeah, I just want to add to that, like you talking about sheer, you talking about value stack that, you know, that is 100% what you want to do. And yeah, when you're, while you're scaling, you want to think about ways to increase your average order value or your customer lifetime value. One of the things that I forgot to mention was one of the things going forward, every single time I look at a product or a store in the back of my mind, I want to think about how can I implement subscription services? Mm -hmm. For example, if you're doing a, a value stack on a winning product that I've seen recently, an LED crochet light. Maybe you can hit up, you know, there's a tons of people that are into crochet. It's a huge niche. And there's a lot of people that have instructional video. So mm -hmm. subscription service, subscription, I can't say it properly, but <laughs> subscription service to send monthly designs that you can create. Like right. all, in the back of my head, always thinking about how I can implement a subscription service. Mm -hmm. That's great. Yeah, value stack, man. That's great, guys. Think, Thanks. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, sorry. So I think one last thing, um, especially when, when you're in the beginner phases um, or let's say it's your first time scaling, like 
always be open to reverse engineering, like see where, you know, where your most drop off is in your funnel. You know, is it after people add to cart? Is it after people enter payment info or select their shipping info? Um, so always reverse engineering. If you're having a low CTR, see where you can improve your ad copy or, you know, your ad creative, uh, you know, so on and so forth. And uh, I was gonna say one other thing, but it's fine. I think I just forgot or something. Yeah. So analyzing your data is a whole other yeah. video <laughs> yeah. itself, man. Yeah, 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 it is, it is, it is. <laughs> yeah. There's just so many, like I've seen people analyze data and these metrics and key, like KPI so many different ways. It's absolutely insane, so. Mm -hmm. But yeah. that's a whole other topic in itself. Yeah, <laughs> before we wrap this up, actually, I wanted to talk about something I do, uh, same for, to, to increase confidence rate and scale. Um, I use eBooks a lot, you know, when I create a store, yeah. Um, around like a specific niche, I have someone uh, write an ebook, or I do it myself, um, to provide like content on something they want to learn. You know, so you see if it's a cooking store, you're gonna provide re nice recipes, could be anything really. And uh, if you have like a really nice ebook that you you know you you hire somebody from on Fiverr or Upwork to make this ebook for you, you can provide the content, um, and you can and, and this helps a lot. People love it because they feel like you're just not just a store, you're actually a brand. You care about them, and you actually provide something for free. Um, so I usually offer this, you know, when they purchase the um, the product and they receive it digitally uh, on the on the email. And a lot of people love it and tell me, oh, we love the ebook, and then we try to we try this and. So yeah, that's a, that's a cool point. It doesn't cost you anything, or almost you know, nothing. You know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, Mark. Mark made a great point, and that was exactly what I was going to say. Like, provide some sort of free asset. Like, it can literally be one page, or even two or three pages. I remember I was selling like this beauty product back in 2018 summer, and I provided basically like an ebook or a playbook, whatever you want to call it, about like five or seven ways to use or put on the product since it was a beauty product mm -hmm. and I made it look nice and appealing and like people loved it you know and they got it digitally right after they placed that order or um, I think it was either that or I think they could download it from the thank you page I got it like custom integrated yeah. so either or point is like try to stand out from your competitors like make it very obvious on your product page itself like Hey, by the way, like you'll also be getting this for free. Mm -hmm. um, I think that just incentivizes people way, 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 way more. Yeah. yeah. And that, I, again, going back to the value stack, the total value of X is $200, but we're only selling it for 50. And then like another app, if you guys want to use for the, um, the digital products called Uplink, Uplink. Um, I don't, I don't really didn't like the Shopify, the Shopify one. So if anyone wants to do the, the ebook, uplink is is the app that you probably want to use right great tips guys i think this has been a very very useful discussion even for all of us um so thanks again to each of you for pouring your hearts out um again if you guys are watching this and you found some value make sure you smash that like button uh comment below 2021 blueprint if you have any questions i'm sure we'll all be answering questions on our on our channels um and if we get lots of good feedback we can again do this again in a few months as a follow-up video um, so again, all the best to all of you for 2021 and uh, we'll, we'll catch you soon. Thanks so Thanks. much. Thank you.